What I have for you today is an interesting but complex case dealing a lot with parent guarantees and implicit support. So we're talking about the Singapore Telecom Australia case here. You can see it's from the Federal Court of Australia. It is from 17 December 2021. So what was happening? You had uh, three countries at play. You had uh, the UK, Singapore and Australia. And in UK, you had cable and wireless, which held a 52% interest in cable and wireless Optus in Australia, which I believe was the second largest telecom operator in Australia. 49% of the other 48%, I should say, of the shares were held by public shareholders. And in Singapore, you had Singtel as a telecom operator, which was indirectly held through an investment fund by the Singapore government. And uh, in March 2001, Singtel submitted a non-binding offer to CW uh, Call Cable and Wireless to acquire 52% to 100% of Cable and Wireless Optus in Australia. On 25 March 2001, Singtel entered into an implementation agreement with CWO with respect to implementing a transaction under which all CWO shareholders would be invited by the bidder, which is then Singtel, to dispose of their CWA shares. And if we look at the conditions of this agreement, it was Singtel was required A, to nominate a bid vehicle that was not an Australian vehicle, which was to make an offer to all CWO shareholders. And I don't know why it could not be a, a Australian um, vehicle. I don't know if this was a wish from Cable and Wireless itself or whether it was a wish from Singtel, you know, let's put this in the contract because then we have a business reason for saying why we're not setting up a, a, an Australian acquisition vehicle, right? Because they might have already thought of the acquisition structure, which involved a leverage takeover, um, which we will see coming up. The second condition to include alternative mechanisms for the disposal by a CWO, share, a CWO shareholder of its CWO shares, including an option to have all or any of its shares bought back by CWO under a share buyback agreement. So they, in other words, in Kevin and Wireless Optus in Australia would simply buy back the shares from the public shareholders. And in the case of CWO shareholders who elected to take the buyback alternative, Singtel had to lend on a subordinated and interest-free basis to CWO the funds necessary for CWO to pay the price payable by the CWO by, by CWO to its shareholders under the share buyback. So this was the deal, and this also got implemented, right? Following SAI, we'll see who that is in a moment. Um, uh, that was the offshore acquisition vehicle of uh, acquisition of CWO. CWO changed its names to Singtel Optus Limited, and then to Singtel uh, Optus Pty Limited. So it's becoming Sopel for the rest of this presentation and the rest of the judgment. The SOPL investment essentially doubles the size of Singtel. Over 2003 to 2009, SOP gener SOPL generated 64.5% of Singtel's revenue and EBITDA contribution in excess of 2 billion, which represents 53% of the Singtel group's EBITDA and 36% of, Singtel's, of the Singtel group's free cash flow. So this was for them a huge acquisition, right? I mean, in terms of, of, of turnover, it was it was uh, almost twice their size, and, uh, and, and and then it doubled the group as a whole. The acquisition resulted in Singtel becoming one of the five largest listed telecom companies in the Asia Pacific re region. And, and and this data is important because it comes back later to talk about how reliable implicit parent guarantees would be. A 10 second commercial. If you want to learn more about international taxation or transfer pricing or treat yourself to an all round update, or if you want your team to learn or stay updated, please visit my online courses. Or how, how likely they would be. Now, what, what is interesting also is how the structure got financed because we need to see what the initial cost was compared to what the cost for the ultimate Australia acquisition vehicle was to to get a bit of perspective on what's going on. So you had Singtel, and it issued uh, $1.14 billion five-year bonds um, in Australian dollars at an interest rate of 3.21%, right? 
Then you had a 700, to, uh, 700 million dollar US dollar, uh, five to seven year bonds, and we don't know what the interest rate on that was. And then a three billion dollar six month bridge facility, which was then later changed to a five billion almost dollar eight year borrowings um, by Singtel. But I, but it's, it's it's interesting to know that the the five year bonds were for 3.21 percent. The, the the court doesn't tell us what the interest rates of the others were. And what Singtel then did is it sacked up uh, Singtel AU Investment Limited, or SI as it gets to called, uh, gets called during the rest of the case. It gave it a ten and a half billion Australian dollars as equity, and it gave it three and a half billion dollars as debt, right? And then it also sub gave the subordinated interest-free loan to um, Cable and Wireless Optus as was agreed in, 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 the, in the bidding agreement. Um, and what happened then was uh, Singtel AU Investments um, acquired uh, Cable and Wireless Optus. It changed the name to Singtel Optus LTD PTY Limited or SOPL. And then the loan was forgiven. Uh, the, what, what in effect happened was that, that the loan got turned into shares which were issued to SAI. And SAI also got a further $7.8 billion in cash from the market. Um, and Singtel also issued another um, uh, $5 billion in shares to the market, all to, all to finance this acquisition, right? The, the, the total acquisition price of, 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 um, of Singtel Optus uh, Limited PTY was around $14, $15 billion. So it's a little unclear to me what the additional cash was needed for, but these were issues that were made um, by Singtel and, 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 and by SIA. As you can see, there was also a, a further $1.3 billion fixed rate uh, securities issue. But now we're going to focus on SAI and SOPL and, 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 and leave the rest out to, 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 to reduce complexity here. Um, and the first thing that happened was SAI um, interposed a new company called the Singapore Telecom AU Investments, Australia Investments P2I Limited. So it's not SAI, but STAI. And uh, STAI got $9 billion in equity, so $1.5 billion less than, 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 than SAI got. And it got $5.2 billion in, um, in debt, almost $1.5 billion more than SAI. And this debt is called the Loan Note Issuance Agreement. And this is the instrument that we're talking about in this case, because it went through a number of amendments. And the question is whether the amendments are what unrelated parties would have accepted. And with that money, um, Stai then acquired SOPL. Now, if we look at, at the pure uh, relationship Psi Stai, and we look at this uh, $5.2 billion loan note uh, investment uh, agreement, then it went through a, 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 a couple of changes, right? Originally, um, you can see the, 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 the acquisition was on, 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 the 6th of, uh, on the 28th of June in 2002, and it was a, 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 a um, what do you call it, an indeterminate uh, um, uh, period for which the for, for which the, the the loans were issued, but they were recallable within a day or within a month. So so the the SAI could recall and ask for redemption at any given time, right? Um, it carried an interest which was the BBSW, which I believe is um, basic bank swap rate. Uh, uh, interest rate um, plus one percent and then that had to be multiplied by 10 over 9 which is about 1,1 right so if, if the BBSW was five percent you then had to take six percent and you had to uh, multiply that by 1,1 so you end up with around 6.6 percent or something like that right um, and and that was the original loan note and and, and this was deemed to be at arm's length and, and and just to give a bit of perspective on this um, Singtel's credit rating at this time was basically LIBOR plus one percent, so so it, it it is more or less in line. Then there came a first amendment in 2002, on the 31st of December, and and it was 
that the loans were now not uh, in perpetuity anymore, but um, but but they were maximum for 10 years, and they, I believe they could still be uh, requested to be redeemed on 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 a day or a month's notice, and the change was with retroactive effect. In other words, back to the 28th of June, um, uh, 2002. And then there was a second amendment, and the second amendment said the interest would now would in future be benchmarked. So what happened uh, un until the second amendment was the interest was simply accrued to the principal if it could not be paid. And um, and, and now it was like, no, 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 now the interest only is, is, is accrued when SOPL um, reaches certain benchmarks in terms of 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 cash flow because remember the idea with a with a leverage takeover would be that sopo would make profits it would dividend those profits out to stai and the stai would then use those dividends to pay off its interest to sai right um they also added and this was the first thing that went wrong they added a premium of four and a half percent and this four and a half percent was a deemed uh cost for now having um having deferred the interest accruals until SOPL became uh, positive in cash flow. And we'll deal with SOPL's cash flow in a moment. Um, and then we, um, we, the, 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 this all happened with retroactive effect until the 28th of June 2002. Um, and then there was a third amendment. And the third amendment uh, basically said, okay, you know what, now we're going to have not the floating rate interest anymore, this BVSW, but we're going to have a fixed interest rate, which is going to be 6.835%. You will add to that the 1% that was also already in the original loan agreement. You'll multiply that with 10 over 9. You will still add the 4.552%, and you will come to 13.2575% on interest to be paid. Now, now remember, Singtel borrowed at, at, at a bit more than 3%, right? So this is quite a jump in, 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 in interest payments. And the tax authorities thought that this was a little too much. So in October 2016, the respondent, the commissioner, made determinations under Division 13 of the Income Tax Act and Subdivision 18, uh, 815 of the Income Tax Act relating to STI and in respect of years ending 31 March. 2010, 11, 12, and 13. I guess the statute of limitation did not allow them to go back further. The determinations under Division 13 um, and under 815 were, were alternative to each other, so, so, so two different claims. And as you can see here, the following table um, sets out uh, Stai's written submissions and sets out the key details in regarding to the actual interest paid and the deduction is denied by the commissioner, right? So the actual interest paid um, Came to, came, to, came to, this is just for these years, uh, is, is in the second column, one billion. For the first year, there's not a huge denied deduction. It's, it's, it's only um, two, two billion or two million. But then you can see from uh, 2011, 12, and 13, we're talking about almost 500 million, almost 350 million, almost 100 million. And these were deductions that were not di direct, directly reducing the tax, but it was actually uh, reducing the loss carry forwards, because what happened was uh, Stai and Sopo formed, formed a, a tax consolidated group, and and the losses of um, of, of of Sopo were offset, um, uh, and, and 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 the interest costs of, of, from from Stai, of course, as well, um, um, against this uh, against this correction. And here you can see the total interest paid by Stai to Stai pursuant to the variation note. So that's not only for 10 to 13, but over all, over all the years um, came to $4.9 billion. I believe that this is over all the years and not only for the, for the four years together. If we look at um, Sopel's cash flow, then, then, then there's an issue to bear in mind, and, and it is the following. It is that uh, SOPL was, was in the telecoms business, um, and the telecom business in Australia, as everywhere else, is hugely competitive, right? And, 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 and telecom companies are required to do a huge amount of upfront investment 
in order to 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 to, to grow right so so there was a huge amount of capex being required all the time and the idea is you put in i don't know let's say one or two billion dollars of equipment and masks and everything else today and then the idea would be that you would earn that back maybe over three years and after four years you become profitable right so you also see the same here in in in, in, in sopel's cash flow for uh, 2001 through to 2005 you can see its cash flow from ordinary activities was was, was big 5 billion 5 billion 6 billion 7 billion almost 8 billion and then its payments from ordinary activities was 4 billion 5 billion uh, it, it, it had a positive net 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 cash provided by operating activities of around 1 billion for 2001 and then very close to 2 billion by 2005 however its capital expenditure exceeded what its net cash was, right? So by uh, 2001, it had 1.8 billion in investment. 2002, it had 1.4 billion, and it became less over the years. But it meant that its cash flow was negative, and since it didn't have cash, it couldn't pay dividends to um, to Stai, and um, and because it couldn't pay dividends to Stai, Stai couldn't pay its interest to Stai, and that meant that the interest had to be accrued. Um, or, or, or at least added to the principle which was agreed in the original agreement and, 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 and also maintained, I believe, in, in, in the First Amendment. But then in the Second Amendment, um, this was changed and they said, you know what, now instead of, of just accruing all this interest uh, to the principle, we'll defer the accrual. But in exchange for that, you're going to pay this 4.75% additional premium on your on, on, on your interest. So that gives a little bit more perspective on, on, on what's going on here. Let us now look at the judgment itself. 